Good morning, my renegades. Welcome back to Rogue Radio. My name is Sarah Jane, and I was going to do this yesterday. I was going to put out an episode yesterday, but I was not feeling the greatest, and I really don't like it when I sound gross, because right now I'm still kind of trying to get myself better and, you know, fully well, but... I am not the best patient when it comes to sitting still and keeping myself um, rested. I don't know what it's about. I really don't. But I have to do something, either with my hands or something else. So I I don't like being idle, um, especially when I'm sick. So today is a pedophile's episode. Now, all of this actually comes from a YouTuber. Um, She laid out the information so well. Um, I can't remember what her name is. Give me a second. Her name is Haley Elizabeth. She does conspiracy theories as well and um, true crime stories. And she did this story about Richard Huckle, and that is who we'll be talking about today. If you have any comments, questions, or concerns, please contact me in the links down in the description below. Thank you. I also don't know how long this episode is going to take, so it may or may not be on YouTube, but we'll find out. We'll see in a minute. So... Richard Huckle was born May 14th, 1986 in Ashford, Kent, England. He was a good kid, had decent grades, had an average home life, he had good friends, and he was well-liked, and went to Harvey Grammar School in Folkestone. He was described as a bit of a loner, but nothing too out of the ordinary, so he was the quiet kid. You know, so he was very smart and at 16, he got to go to school in Nambia um, in an exhibition, uh, helping people who are poor and live in, you know, bad situations. So it was basically a mission trip. Um, And a year later, at 17, he graduated high school and his parents gave him a digital camera for graduation because he was interested in photography. And but he became it became a gateway. That camera became a gateway to his misdeeds later on. Um, he did live in a religious family, but it was not strict. Um, Ashford Baptist Church um, was the church that he attended, and he used his photography skills to help promote the church. And he took his pictures of like baptisms and events and stuff like that and yeah so he was an active member in his church and in the mission trip that he was on beforehand and no one saw anything out of the ordinary and usually no one usually does no one really does see something out of the ordinary when it comes to crime evolving because it's one thing for a crime to pop up out of someone which does happen but it is less noticeable when that crime starts evolving and this case is something that I would say like the crime did evolve very slowly and very unnoticeably for years 
He attended South Kent College in a two-year program, and he majored in information communications technology, which will make sense later on, um, and a certification in photography. He graduated the college and decided that he didn't want to go into an IT job just yet and started focusing on going to third world countries and taking photos of his travels. Um, he took a gap year and went to Malaysia through a program called World Challenges. And he wanted to pursue photography before fully graduating college and getting a job. So he sent an email, <clears throat> excuse me, he sent an email to the company while signing up uh, that he specifically wanted to work with the schools in the orphanage. There were four orphanages available, but only one took him in since the other three didn't feel comfortable. And rightfully so, because this is how he slowly started getting access to children. That is when him and another person who signed up Sammy, um, who went with him, were sent to the school to teach English to the children in Malaysia. They shared an apartment together at this time, and Sammy said that he was very, very quiet, and that he was uh, much more outgoing on the emails than in person. They usually are. They usually are. They, I, from what I know, is that predators have many faces in order to please people and make them comfortable enough for it's like focus on this hand while the other hand is doing something you know evil that, that's basically what it is he's a puppeteer um he was very nervous when he was around kids even though he said that he was very good with them Sammy said that uh, he was only interested in taking pictures. Richard switched churches and went to teach Sunday school in Kuala Lumpur, which he describes in his diary his hunting ground. So throughout this time, he has um, kept a diary of his experiences in Malaysia especially the things that he did criminally there as well so it 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 all snowballs later on but i can't get into that yet but he kept a journal recording his expeditions accounting every child he taught at the sunday school he said i quote i had some of the children sit with me for a cuddle while we pulled out the mattress and had a relaxed session this was when he was at 19 years old he was 19 years old when he was doing this this is where he ended up starting to record his pedophile ways and started to get or started to act on his desires very slowly like i said when a predator wants to prey on something they slowly try to weasel or slither their way in that's how they work this is why I make these episodes is for you guys to spot a predator in your home in your family in your friend group in your community that way you guys know how these people operate and how you can tackle this. This is why I talk about pedophiles. The pastor of this church went on to say later that Richard was never with the children unsupervised as well as him never being a Sunday teacher at the school, despite all his journal entries saying otherwise. So the reason why I think that this pastor has said this, because to be honest, uh, throughout this whole episode, you'll find that all of the orphanages that he does try to get his hands on, he, the rules are they're not allowed. He's not allowed. Anybody who's a volunteer is not allowed to have unsupervised time with these children. So either that was a fantasy recorded from 
Richard. Or this actually happened and he was being sneaky and the staff was being lenient with him. Because, like I said, predators are charming. They don't just come out say, hey, I'm a pedophile. No, no, that's not what they do. Um, they have to be trusted first. And also throughout this episode, you know, the way the Malaysian government and the way the people of Malaysia kind of deal with Richard Huckle is unconventional um, compared to what we would do in America. And I know that's probably because of culture differences. Differences. The World Challenges program dropped him from the organization when a complaint was made about him hitting one of the students. So he allegedly hit one of the students. So after that, he could not stay in the apartment that they were, um, you know, keeping him in. He had nowhere to stay and had no money but still wanted to stay in the country. So he got better at the language and did his own um, solo travels. He did freelance photography and and was accepted into many families and villages and he was welcomed into their homes and gave gave him a place to sleep and made him food. So basically right now he was a homeless vagabond. Like he relied on other people for means of food, shelter, and a place to sleep. And, yeah, I don't know, man. That's kind of creepy. But these families, of course, had children. He was preying on families with children. In 2006, at the age of 20, he went to Cambodia because it wasn't working out for him financially in Malaysia. And in Cambodia... Um, is where he would execute his, you know, very first crime. Uh, One family he stayed with in Cambodia said Richard was very kind and sweet and offered to teach kids English and gained their trust that way. That's another thing. I feel like that's what it is called, like the golden handcuffs. Golden handcuffs usually talks about, like, financial means, like, hush money stuff but golden handcuffs can mean anything as well um because i see the difference between like bribing someone with money saying if you do this for me then i'll give you this amount of money it's like if you take me in to your home and give me a place to sleep food to eat and security then i will teach your kids english and teach them, like, give them professional photos and stuff like that. So it was like a promise for a promise. And uh, that's the way he was able to get into all of these homes and with these families because they he promised them to teach them English and give them nice professional-looking photos of their kids and stuff like that. And that's how he got away with this stuff. This family had a two-year-old daughter and was the first victim of Richard Huckle. He sexually abused her and filmed it. There was a local church he started volunteering at, and that's when he said he fell in love with a three-year-old girl. He said that he fell in love with a three-year-old girl. That's not possible, and it's not real. I don't care how anybody tries to spin it, that's disgusting. You're preying on a little girl, three years old, three fucking years old. And you say that you you fell in love with her. No. That just leaves a bad taste in my mouth. (sighs) Over the next several years, he sexually abused her regularly. He was also um, on the dark web a lot and documented his crimes on there to other pedos and made a post on a forum saying, I hit the jackpot, a three-year-old girl as loyal to me as my dog, 
and nobody seems to care. A three-year-old I can have so much relations with that it's just boring. Uh, well, at least she is ready for um, business with bl Okay. There are sites on the dark web that I know of because of the information that I got. And I'm not going to sit here and say the name of any of these websites, these pedophile websites, because as much as I have faith in my listeners, I know one of y'all is probably either curious to see if this is still up, or just wants to see for yourself if, if this is real. It, no, I'm not even going to give anybody any space in order to investigate this. I'm not going to give anybody any carrot, basically, for you guys to go and visit this and be stupid. So, this website that he is talking about does have a name, so we're not going to talk about that. We're not. I'm not going to mention it, so I'm just going to call it Site A, because this is the first site that he ends up going to and ends up starting to brag about all of this stuff. So Site A is a website on the dark web that makes and sells child porn, or CP. So, he used his camera to film and take pictures of the three-year-old girl, but also made her watch it. Yeah. A couple years later, she came out to her father about the abuse, but was told to keep quiet. See... I know this happens in American families as well because of the shame that it, it brings to the family. Like, I understand, but I don't understand. Like, your kid is telling you that they have been abused and you're like, oh, well, just be quiet about it. It's okay. It's just be quiet about it. I'm just like, make it make sense. Your child has cried out for help. To the patriarch of the family, the father of the family, the father that's supposed to keep that child safe. And her hopes of being protected were dashed because, oh, just keep quiet. Like I said, this is these are cultural differences. I don't know how they handle it in Malaysia or Cambodia, but this really upset me. Because it's like, even families of victims have silenced victims about talking about it. Because they don't want to be embarrassed. They don't want to be shamed. And it breaks my heart. There were a four and six year old. They were two sisters that became his other victims. And he would frequently sexually assault those girls. And there were rumors that the sisters were related to the three-year-old that he was living with. Um, and online, he kind of does describe something like this. But this this clue is kind of inconclusive, but it is a rumor. It's something that's hearsay. We don't really know if this these two girls were related or not. But the suspicions were that he met the girls from an extended family party that he was invited to. He lived there until 2007 and went back to the UK, but would make frequent trips um, to Malaysia. At the age of 24, he moved to Malaysia full-time nearby. There was a village that welcomed him and allowed him to teach English at the school. Um, yeah. There, this village was made up of poor and uneducated families and even got a certification for teaching English there, both kids and adults. And to think about it, okay, he's a pedophile and he's doing so much work 
in order for him to look legit, in order for him to be trusted and worthy enough to be left alone with these kids so that he can sexually assault them. There is no, um, there's no length that a pedophile will not go to in order to get a child to victimize. Remember that. He got a certification to teach English in Malaysia for both kids and adults. He offered free tutoring because he became a private tutor. So he hung around Port Dixon Beach around this time and would contact the families to take professional and uh, professional photos of their kids and ask for an email and number to send the pictures um, to the families. Sometimes they would, you know, he would ask for the address. That way he knew exactly where they were. So he would just lurk around Port Dixon Beach and he would come up to families with kids and say, oh, hey, you know, I am a professional photographer. I can take professional photos for you for free. And then, you know, I'll, you know, send it to you later on. Who knows what he was doing with the photos beforehand. But anyway, this is how he gained access to kids and he would do this frequently to abuse the kids. Free education isn't passed up in third world countries. That's a dream come true. So anybody uh, in a third world country that comes up and says, I want to give your kid free education. I want to give your kid um, an opportunity in America. I want to do this, this, and this with your family. You know, anything free in a third world country is a dream come true. And Richard Huckle knew that. So he was actually tugging at the heartstrings of the parents as well. This is strategic. This is how they... This is how they operate. He says in his diary, I am back again at Port Dixon and staying around the house of my 12th family. I spent time with the baby trying to get her to sleep in a hammock. So he is spending time with a new family and he's spending time with a baby, right? And I guess the hammock is where he sleeps and he's trying to get the baby to sleep in the hammock with him. That's sick. Uh, he traveled to India where he tried to pick up on some volunteer opportunities at orphan orphanages. All the while, the orphanage there, orphanages there, sorry, had a strict uh, rule that he wasn't allowed to have any alone time with any of these children. Good. I'm very glad that they did that. Um, this was, I guess, in 2013, but um, at the age of 27, New Hope for Children was emailed by Richard saying that he was an English teacher and tutor and photographer offering uh, his services free. The pastor of this orphanage describes Richard as very quiet and awkward, never looked into the eyes of any of the adults that were there and would talk past them. So he would look past them and talk to them, which is strange. Um, and he started selling CP online as well around this time. So there were hundreds and thousands of photos that were uploaded to the dark web of uh, his crimes dating back to 2005. One of the websites he would frequently go on was called Site B. Once again, I'm not going to give out the website just because even though this site is taken down, it has been taken down, there could be posts, there could be 
still photos lurking around somewhere on the internet from this specific website that I don't want anyone to find because I have faith in my listeners. I don't think that any of you would, but a lot of people are curious about certain things like this, and I don't think you should be that curious. Curiosity kills the cat. But this website had over 45,000 active members. 45,000 pedophiles on this one website. That's disgusting. And it's a community. They, they talk about victimizing children. They, they talk about filming children. They talk about doing things to children. And they think that this is okay to talk about. They think that... Every time I do one of these episodes, I'm flabbergasted, and I know that pedophiles exist. I know that they exist. I know that they're evil people. But every single time I I read about an individual story, it makes me even sicker, because they actually think... Pedophiles actually think that this is normal behavior. They think that this is okay to talk about how, you know, Richard Huckle has even compared the three-year-old girl that he victimized like a dog. I hate that. This is how pedophiles think. But anyway, to access the site, he needed to upload to the site at least once a month. And if the profile looked at all suspicious, it was immediately terminated. The more you uploaded, the higher your rank would be. And the highest was called producer status. They had ranks. They had pedophile ranks on here. Like, what the heck? It it just makes me angry. Like, they think that this is a lifestyle. They think that this is okay to do. It's not. It's, it's, It's not a trend. It's not something that you should be proud of. If you have these thoughts, go get fucking help. God damn it. Um, okay. He always posted on this site, of course. Of course he did. He was producer status and was uploading weekly. He uploaded once a week. He was abusing children weekly. This wasn't just a one-time thing, it was not a monthly thing, it wasn't actually periodical. It was every week he was abusing children. Richard was so invested in his online presence that he put themes to his videos and CP, or photos, of his content. And he was supported and applauded by pedophiles online who actually encouraged him to push the envelope. This gave him an ego trip and he seeked validation all of the time and it was a drug to him. And it made him do more and more and more. Richard created a point system for his crimes called the Pedo Points Chart. He thinks that this is a fucking game! He thinks that this is fun. I... I can't... I'm trying my best not to get too angry because I don't know how my voice is going to take it. There were 15 categories. 15 sexual abuse categories. It was like he put himself into this imaginary game show and whenever he decided to assault somebody... He decided to put it down in his journal and give himself points, like credits, like... (sighs) 
each act was worth an amount of points. The highest was rape, which equated to 15 points. So rape was the highest point system. That, that was the highest points that you could get if you raped a child. If he raped a child, he gained 15 points for himself. Like, this is how narcissistic he is. This is how how full of himself he was and how confident he was about not getting caught that he gave himself points like he was in a video game. After a year of keeping the chart, okay, his points came out to 1,305. So in order to get that many points, and since we know that the highest uh, rank of points is 15, which is rape, he would have to commit rape 87 times within one year. Think about that. I mean, yes, there are different points for different acts. But let's just say he just decided to rape people for a whole year. He would have to do it 87 times to get 1,305 points. Even talking about this is like... He actually thought that he was the best at this and that he couldn't get caught. It, so much so that he made a point system for himself. Never mind the emotional and physical damage that and psychological damage that you put these kids through. Oh no, fuck them, right? You didn't give a shit. You did not give a shit at all about these children. They were points to you. They were points to you. He did other things, but it is evil, of course. Um, that the kids he had hurt had to suffer for his fucking points this way. Um, 2014, his crimes were exposed and an Australian officer had been on the website he was frequently posting on and was closing in on uh, some of the most constant members, including Richard. In Toronto in 2011, the police found a dark website called Site C and started um, closing in on some of the members and the owner of the website. They did catch this person, the owner of Site C, okay? It's not Site B, not the one that uh, Richard was constantly posting on, but this is how the criminal system works. This is how um, they catch online predators. And uh, so we're not going to be talking about Richard for a while. So <clears throat> Brian Way owned the site two years and got $4 million off of his child pornography. He became a millionaire by selling child pornography. He was taken down, or the site was taken down, and it was supposed he was supposed to serve like 10 years in prison, but he opened up about being sexually abused as a child as well as in prison, and his 10 years turned to 20 months as well as a $20,000 bail. He has $4 million. He, 20, 20 mil... 20,000 is not, is nothing to him. He, he could have just bailed himself out. And I don't care if he does get assaulted in prison. He deserves it. Damn it. Like, what the hell? So, okay, I gotta talk psychologically now because I am a recovery coach and I do know that pedophilia is a learned behavior just as much as any other behavior. And sometimes pedophiles within the family think that abusing a child sexually is like 
turning on the TV. That's how criminals think. It's very regular, it's very um, routine-like, it's something that is normal to them, and they've been trained to believe that it is normal because of their past of being abused. In order for a pedophile to become a pedophile, it usually happens when they've been abused themselves and they can't escape that abuse mentally, so they have to act out that um, same problem in order to escape their mind a lot of the time. So I'm not going to sit here and say um, that a pedophile just pops up like, hey, I like kids. I've never had a history of mental illness or child abuse or sexual abuse. There, There is always some sort of history of sexual, mental, um, emotional abuse when it comes to a pedophile. So I do believe that Brian Way was sexually abused as a child, but the way society, like the, the, the society today, okay, even back then, okay, pedophilia is not smiled upon. Pedophilia is not okay. It is not accepted in society, nor should it ever be accepted in society. So the fact that he had earned $4 million off of peddling child pornography makes me believe that he has rejected the conditions of society saying that pedophilia is not okay and he has decided to go against that and decide to say that pedophilia is okay and that victimizing children is okay because if you were remorseful like you were like you did in the courtroom in order to get 20 fucking months instead of 10 years then you wouldn't be repeating this action he was he was a proud pedophile and i hate that they go ahead and lean on their past experience of abuse in order to get out of being in prison. You deserve prison more than anybody else. I don't care. In my opinion, I don't care if you were previously victimized. You need help. You need to be taught a lesson. You need to be put in prison. Because you lived in a society that said that pedophilia was wrong and you decided otherwise. There is no excuse to me for a pedophile to be walking the streets looking at our kids. No excuse whatsoever. We're going to take a break so I can cool down. Hopefully you can cool down. All right. So give me a second. Hello, my renegades. If you haven't heard about Anchor by Spotify, it's the easiest way to make a podcast with everything you need all in one place. Let me explain. Anchor has tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone and computer. And when hosting on Anchor, you can distribute your podcast on listening platforms like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. And best of all, Anchor is totally free. Download your Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. It's a lot of fun, so come join us. Anyway, uh, Brian Way in 2016 was released and he is out in the world and could still be peddling his child porn. Good job, law system. I, you just 
you're you're fucking awful. I I just don't understand, but these police also located a man in Queensland who was on site C. Remember, there's three different sites mentioned in this episode. So this is site C where Brian Way was the operator of this website. And site B. So this next guy was an active member of site C and site B. All right. And that's how they got to Richard. So finding the owner of site B out of 45,000 members, which was a multi-million dollar website. Okay. The owner made a mistake of posting his own personal content to the website too. They found him on a Facebook forum. So the pedophile website site B was uh, where he would post personal information as well because let's just face it sometimes pedophiles get so confident that they're not going to get caught ever that they kind of brag and let out some stuff and so whatever post that he made on site B was Uh, how they got to his Facebook. Um, So they found him on a Facebook forum and then um, they hit a dead end until they made a Facebook account on the marketplace. So what this guy, uh, the owner of site site B, was doing on um, Facebook is that he was trying to sell... Um, a certain part, a certain car part. And um, it was a fake profile, the one that they found. So that's how they hit a dead end. But they end up, they ended up finding the same post with the same wording and the same type of manner uh, that this uh, dead end had. And, um, yeah, so the police acted like they were interested in this part and they decided to post a picture of their truck and their truck mistakenly, of course, had, you know, their license plate. So they didn't blur out the license plate. They didn't like scratch it out at all. They just sent the police a picture of their truck. And that's how they got his plate number. They arrested 32-year-old Shannon McCall. They searched his house. His laptop was open. And a bunch of hard drives were everywhere around the laptop. And the laptop was open to site B. So. Shannon worked at a daycare. He worked at a daycare. And this is in Australia. Um, People said that he was very kind, very sweet. He was good with kids. And women found that it it was attractive for a man to work with kids. They thought that that was wholesome, that, you know, he could become a good father and all that stuff. He worked there despite having three charges of child abuse. How the hell does an owner of a daycare just pass up a background check. See, this is how charming pedophiles can be. They're not just like some greasy windbag sitting at a bus stop looking at a kid with their hand in their pocket and the pocket has a hole in it, okay? No, they're not just those types of people. I mean, how does that make sense, though? The fact that he had three charges of child abuse and he still was able to work at a daycare um yeah no either that company was very careless and was very lazy and they did not decide to look into his background or 
this guy turned on the charm and they thought, oh, well, he's a good guy. There's no need to look in his past. Always do a background check. Always. All right. No one where... Blah, 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 blah. Sorry. No one was aware of his past at all. No one was aware of his um, sight that he was operating either. And he served about 35 years after uh, he ended up getting arrested. So, I mean, still not long enough to me. I wish that every pedophile would get at least 500 years in jail, but of course, that's just a fantasy for me. That's just a dream. Uh, because I don't know why. I, I really don't know why the, the law system has decided to be so lenient with pedophiles. Because they victimize your kids, man. They, they want your kids to suffer. They want to make your kids... They want to take the innocence from your kids and... Yeah, that's how I feel. <laughs> um, no, it, I've said this before. I don't remember how or where, when I said this. I know I said this before on my podcast. A child's innocence is their secret weapon. Okay? That's how they know who to be around. Their innocence is how they perceive the world, and when their innocence is taken away, the only thing they see is people who mean them harm. It's hard for a child to trust when their innocence has been taken away. Their child, the children need their innocence in order to develop properly, okay? children need their innocence to believe that anything is possible. They need their innocence to believe that there are good people out there that do mean good to them. They need their innocence in order to not seem, you know, prey to other people that mean them harm. And I just... I hate the fact that there are people out there taking the innocence of children. I mean, leave them alone. Leave them be. Their purity is what makes them beautiful. Their purity is their secret weapon. Kids perceive a lot more than we give them credit for. And it's just wrong. It's wrong for anyone to take the innocence of a child. It is not yours to take. It is not yours to possess. And if I don't talk about this, who the fuck will? Because now we have people in the LGBTQ that want pedophiles to be a part of the LGBTQ? Fuck no. I'll be the first one to say and stand up and say, fuck no. Fuck you. This is my way of protecting your kids. Okay? This is my way of informing parents who are who don't really know where to start when it comes to, you know, teaching their kids how to be safe and how to learn who is trustworthy and who is not. This is my way of teaching people that you can't always trust people. You can't always trust each other, okay? A lot of the time, the pedophiles that... Um, decide to victimize children are within the family. So, I'm just saying, there's a reason why people say blood don't make you family. Okay? I'm a firm believer in that. Okay? 
I'm a firm believer in that. Because I've been victimized in my life. And I will not stop talking about it. I will not stop talking about it. I will not stop talking about these pedophiles that need to be brought to light. Because they need to be punished. I have so much hate. I have so much hate for people who, who decide to hurt children. I just don't understand it. And I'm sorry, I, I don't mean to be emotional this time. It seems like every time I do this episode, I end up getting so angry and so emotional and so hurt. And I told myself I wasn't going to get emotional, so excuse me. But there's a special place in hell for people like this. Okay, and I do. I have so much hate for people who victimize children, and I don't know if it'll ever go away. And I understand that some of you, some of the pedophiles out there, have been victimized before, but that does not give you the right to take the innocence of a child. It's never an excuse. Everyone has the choice to do right or wrong. But after uh, Shannon McCall was taken to prison, the cops were able to find the producer status pedophiles and decided to target them first. And so they found Richard Huckle and they said that... Um, he didn't have an IP address tied to any of his posts. And that's probably why he ended up going into IT, like um, technology in uh, college. That way um, he was he would be able to like tie up his loose ends. That way he wouldn't be very easy to track. Which makes me sick. Like this was all premeditated crime. That's disgusting to me. Um, all of it is, but, um, in one of his posts, I guess he said that he wanted to be remembered in the pedophile community for his photography. So the psychology behind Richard Huckle and his, um, <clears throat> his misdeeds is, uh, uh, pedophiles do things for different reasons. Not every pedophile is the same, unfortunately. But, um, a lot of pedophiles have many different reasons on why they victimize children. Richard's was, it gave him a sense of control, power, and it boosted his ego, basically. It, it made him feel greater than everybody else around him, that he was able to get away with victimizing children. It was a power thing with him. He gained power over children because he was able to victimize children so easily in these underprivileged countries. They did locate him in Malaysia, but they could not locate him specifically. Like I said, there was no IP address at all. Um, they figured out what model of camera he had been using, linking it to a Flickr account. And a Flickr account is specifically, I don't know if it's actually around today, but I remember Flickr. It was a um, website where photographers could put their uh, work up. And uh, I don't know if they sold it or anything. It was just like, it was a community for photographers, basically. And um, they found Richard's account there. And... Uh, they found his email and located him specifically after that. So they found his Facebook profile and all of them were of him posing with kids, which were kids he abused. So he would take selfies with these kids that he abused and posted on Facebook, but all of the other content was posted on site B and site A. The Australian police presented the evidence to the UK and contacted Malaysian police to deport him back to the UK 
Um, they even handed the Malaysian police all this evidence, but didn't act for four months because of insignificant evidence. I don't understand because um, later on you'll find out how many like photos this man took and videos this man took. But... The UK had to wait for him to come back home to arrest him. On December 14th in 2014, though, um, they were able to arrest him and he was taken into questioning. His hard drives and laptops had layers of encryption on it. Again, the work of an IT class. Um, and they needed every passcode to get inside. So, actually... Um, we won't actually know how much he truly had um, on his hard drive and on his laptop because he's hidden them in so many layers of encryption. But he stayed silent through interrogation and didn't comply and he was rela released on parole because of this under the condition that he stays with his parents until further notice. His family was in shock and his mom and dad sat him down with him and um, he confessed to everything. His parents called the police and they apprehended him. Um, he was arrested on 90 counts of sexual offenses on children and distributing and creating CP. They are, there is a speculation that over 200 children were abused though. Um, at his trial, he pleaded not guilty and believed that he wasn't at fault and told the judge that the CP wasn't his and that they just popped up on his hard drives. That would not explain the fact that the children that you posted selfies with online were the exact same children that you took photos of of uh, your abuse. So you abused the children that you took selfies of on Facebook. Over an hour, it took an over an hour to read all his crimes, and the judge made a call to separate um, the offenses into three separate jurors because he said that not one jury could be subjected to all of his crimes because that would affect their mental health. And to be honest, good on this judge because I would have done the same thing. I, I really would have done the same thing because subjecting at like one set of jury to see all this evidence it yeah it would it would for me it would piss me off but yeah it would affect the mental health of those people who had to sit and go through all of this evidence but he ended up getting 20,000 child okay yeah sorry he had in his possession and like I said there's probably still more that we don't know of that were on his hard drives but the ones that they could get their hands on they had he had um, 20,000 child abuse photos and 1,000 videos of children being victimized and they even got into his account and said that um, this is what he said in, in his account. He said, Impoverished kids are much, much easier to seduce than middle-class Western kids. I still plan on publishing a guide to sub... This... I can't... I'm so mad I can't read. I'm sorry. Impoverished kids are much, much easier to seduce than middle-class Western kids. I still plan on publishing a guide on this subject sometime. He created a manual on how to victimize and subject children to sexual abuse. They did find this guide all typed out, and it was a 60-page document called Pedophile and Poverty Child Lover Guide. How to Get Away with Pedophilia in Poverty-Stricken Kids. 
encouraging others to do the same. Richard's convictions um, in April, he got um, a plea deal for only 71 counts of child abuse instead of 90. I don't know why they decided to give him... Why, why not charge him with all 90? I don't understand that. He victimized children from the ages from 6 to 12 months. That's disgusting. Um, there's an insane amount of crimes that I'm about to list. So, um, he was charged with three counts of causing a child under 13 to engage in sexual activity, three counts of causing under 13 child uh, into penetrative activity, eight counts of assault by penetration, 12 counts of indecent photos of children, 13 counts of rape and of child of a child under 13, 31 counts of assault of a child under 13, advertising CP and facilitating offenses by making a manual, and that is not even half of what he was charged with. Like I said, it took it over an hour to read all of his offenses to the jury. He ended up getting life in prison with possibility of parole in 25 years. So what that means is after 25 years of his sentence, they would circle back and see if he was a changed man. And if he wasn't, he would serve the rest of his life sentence. But people speculated he would get out earlier than that, but never lived to see that day of parole because a fellow inmate murdered Richard Huckle in his room. So, yeah. I won't go in the de into the details of how he was killed, but he was brutally murdered, and he was also sexually assaulted during his torture. So, um, I think I may have missed a page. I really hope I didn't, but I do remember writing down that he thought that him posting all of these videos and all of these photos he seriously believed that it was an art form. I'm sorry. Don't don't give art a bad name. I don't I know everybody says that art is open for interpretation, that it is how the artist ends up seeing how art is. Like everybody's perception of art is different, and I understand that and I accept that. To a point. Of course, because if you're victimizing children for the sake of your art form, you need to fucking die. I don't care. Don't sit here and say that what you do is an art form, especially when it hurts the most purest of souls on this earth. And anybody who thinks that way, fuck you. I really hope you get help, but if you choose not to, fuck you. Alright, I have no sympathy and no empathy for any pedophile out there. Just know that. And if you are one, guess what? I'm going to be talking about you too. That is it for this episode. Thank you for being patient with me. Thank you for listening, and I will see you in the trenches next time. 